the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday after Epiphany. From wherever we are, God is gathering us together into one community of grace and love. We begin today by confessing our sin, trusting in God's abundance. Holy One, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciliation and peace. Amen.
Let us pray. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let the children come. Good morning, children. I'm glad to see you. I'm so glad that you're here. In our Bible story this morning, we hear of Jesus healing people. And in fact, we hear many stories in the Bible of Jesus healing people, making them well. At Gloria Day, we like to say that we are a caring and healing congregation. Healing is part of our work together. And in fact, we have a nurse who's part of our congregation, Jill Stewart. Her job is parish nurse. I'd like to talk with her about that work, but it wouldn't be safe for us to meet face to face. So I'll give her a video call. Come with me. Hi, Jill. I'm glad you could talk with me. I wanted to ask you about being a parish nurse. Tell me about your job. I am a parish nurse at Gloria Day, and it's a fun job. I really like my job. One of the things that's important about being a parish nurse is that we help people to take care of their bodies and their minds and their spirits. Church is a really good place for us to take care of our bodies and our minds and our spirits. Every public health nurse has a big bag of things to help them do their job. This is mine. I'm going to show you some things that are in there. With pandemic, one of the things I'm using is, is my mask. I use a cell phone because I can call people to see how they're feeling. I have got, I have got some gloves here. I've got a stethoscope. I use this to help check people's blood pressure. And sometimes... We have classes when it's not pandemic. We can all get together and have exercise classes at Gloria Day. I've got a prayer book, and I can use this when I visit with people to help them take care of their spirits. And some of my friends make beautiful prayer shawls. Isn't that nice? It's really soft. And people can have a prayer shawl to make them remember that God loves them when they're feeling sad. Another thing that I have in my bag is my communion kit and something that, we do, that parish nurses do along with the pastors is bring communion to people when they are stuck at home and they can't come to church for communion. So that's an important thing that we do. How wonderful. Do you think children could be involved in being helping us be a caring and healing congregation? Oh, I think children are really good at that. I think because children are very caring people, that they are really good at it. And I think that children can help people to remember, wash their hands, 
They can help people to remember to wear their masks. Yep. They can help remember to eat healthy food and play outside and get some exercise every day to take care of their bodies. And children can pray for their friends and people who are sad or help them when they're sick. And if someone is sick and they're hurt and it's something that you can't take care of yourself because you need a grown up, children can help by telling a grown up. Oh, I love that. I think that's wonderful. I really am glad that we have a parish nurse and that you can help us all be strong and safe and healthy, and that you can also remind us how we can help others be strong and safe and healthy too. Thank you. Thank you for your work, Jill. And maybe you can help us pray. And the children I know will pray with us as well. Children, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for nurses. Thank you for doctors. Thank you for the way you keep us healthy. Help those people who are sick and help us be loving and caring for all your people. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, children. Thank you, Pastor Lois. A reading from Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught, and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He underst his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, 
and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Every time I step foot in a public place these days, I am hyper aware of how tight my mask is on my face, how close I am to others, and whether the people around me are being as vigilant as I am or are carelessly flouting the rules. It is exhausting. Like so many others, I am quick to pass judgment on those who show up at grocery stores and refuse to wear a mask, and those who continue to gather in large crowds as though this whole thing is just a big joke. But when I stop to think about it, it's actually heartbreaking how this pandemic has taught us to so carefully avoid physical contact with others, and even to shun those who defy public health guidance. People who, I have to imagine, simply long to maintain the kinds of physical contact and social connection that are such a fundamental part of our human existence. There was a long article that appeared in the Guardian newspaper back in December, examining the impact of all of this on the human psyche. One psychotherapist says, she misses waiting in line at lunchtime at her local sandwich shop. She says it used to be that they were all waiting to pay for sandwiches that they'd just be taking back to their desks, that it was somehow still a sort of group activity, even if she didn't know the other people in the group. These days, those lines of people waiting together at the checkout have become a series of regularly spaced people being processed by a wayfinding system. That rigidly organized and carefully directed lineup process creates a sense of alienation and even rejection as we are made to keep ourselves apart from one another. Further rejection occurs if a pedestrian steps into the gutter to avoid you, or when the delivery person you're, you used to enjoy greeting sees you at the door and lunges backwards. She says, it provides no consolation to understand cognitively why we repel others. The sense of rejection remains. What is the cost of all of this? It turns out our bodies have certain kinds of nerves that are concentrated in hard to reach places like our back and shoulders. They wire social touch into a complex reward system in our brains. So when we are touched or hugged or patted on the back, a hormone is released that lowers the heart rate and limits our body's stress response. In other words, just the occasional subtle physical connection with another human being keeps us on an even plane. At a time when so many of us are going without regular human contact, neuroscientists have begun to study the ramifications of a prolonged loss of physical connection. 
what they're finding is that the loss of the connecting power of touch triggers factors that contribute to depression, like sadness, lower energy levels, and lethargy. That psychotherapist who misses waiting in line at the deli says it's like we're becoming sort of non-people. Masks render us mostly faceless. Hand sanitizer is a physical screen. It's like there's a barrier, like not speaking somebody's language. Human contact, physical connection, loving touch are essential. And without it, our lives are severely diminished. Simon and Andrew bring Jesus to their mother-in-law's home, where she lies sick in bed. This is not the first time I've read this passage, but this time around in the era of COVID-19, this scene struck me a little differently. I assume none of them were wearing masks, much less shields and gloves and gowns. And I don't get the sense that any of them were adhering to social distancing protocols or proper hand hygiene. It gets even worse in the next scene when Mark describes all the sick people in town gathering outside Jesus' door seeking healing. At this point, all my COVID alarms are blaring. Jesus has created, I am certain, a super spreader event. The entire gospel lesson today takes place over just 11 verses, but there's a lot to unpack. You've maybe begun to notice that Mark doesn't spend a lot of time beating around the bush. He gets right to the point, and each verse is dense with material for us to consider. So indulge me for just a moment for a little bit of Bible study. First, did you notice that Mark never names Simon and Andrew's mother-in-law. Partly, this is probably the patriarchy at work. In Mark's gospel, only a few women are named, only the important women. Simon and Andrew's mother-in-law, not important. No name necessary. Yes, you should be offended. But the fact that the woman isn't named also tells us something significant about what's going on in this story. You would expect important people to have access to great medical care. In the story the world tells, important people find healing. But here in Mark's gospel, it's this not very important person, an unnamed woman, who the ancient world saw as a nobody. She is the one who is healed. And not only that, but this act of healing brings Jesus into an intimate space, into a woman's bedroom. He stands at her bedside and touches her. He takes her by the hand and lifts her up. Oh, and lifts her up here in the biblical Greek It's the same verb used to describe how Jesus is raised from the dead on Easter morning. Jesus raises this insignificant woman up from the dead and restores her to life. Later that evening, swarms of sick people come to Jesus begging for healing. Here in the first chapter of Mark's gospel, Jesus is just beginning his ministry in the region of Galilee, the northernmost part of Israel. The religious and political elites who lived down south in Jerusalem looked down on those backwards Galileans up north. Biblical scholar Ched Myers notes that economic and political deterioration had dispossessed significant portions of the Galilean population. These crowds of Galileans were among the poorest people in Israel. Disease and physical disability were an inseparable part of the cycle of poverty, a phenomenon that's still true today despite the advent of modern medicine. 
For these people, illness meant unemployment and instant impoverishment. These are the people who gather outside Jesus' door seeking healing. And Jesus is there for them. So putting this all together, first, Jesus raises up a not very important woman, and then he heals an entire crowd of people who had been left behind. Some have pointed out that Jesus doesn't spend any time asking these sick people about their symptoms or trying to determine a diagnosis. He's not a doctor. He's not practicing medicine. The point isn't really that Jesus finds sick people and makes them feel better. Jesus encounters people who have been pushed down and lifts them up, raises them from death, and restores them to life. At a time when illness was perceived to be the result of sin, and being ill therefore meant you were shunned by the broader community, being healed didn't mean just getting over an illness. It meant being restored to one's community. And that work requires touch. It requires intimacy. Pastor P.C. Ennis puts it this way. He says, The power of touch, of intimacy, of nearness to make whole, Jesus must have understood that which we are too often too slow to comprehend. Love not expressed, love not felt, is difficult to trust. Theologically speaking, that is the reason for incarnation. God knew the human need for nearness. Jesus is the incarnation of God's love. A doctor named Richard Selzer tells a story about the miracle of touch. He writes, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted, palsy, clownish, a tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, had been severed. To remove the tumor in her cheek, I had cut the little nerve. The young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It's because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent, but the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. He bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close that I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate her, to show her that their kiss still works. I hold my breath and let the wonder in. This pandemic that has forced us to keep our distance from one another and avoid physical contact with others has given me a renewed appreciation for physical touch. And it's given me a whole different lens through which to read and interpret stories about a Jesus who shows up at our bedside when we are feeling worse than ever, takes us by the hand, lifts us up, and embodies God's love for us. We worship a God who knows what it takes to make us feel whole and well, who is determined to raise us to new life and restore us to our communities. God will lift us up and raise us to life. May it be so. Amen.
on January 23rd, Catherine Ann Ostley was ordained into the Ministry of Word and Sacrament here at Gloria Day with a few of her friends and family, presided over by Bishop Ann Svenningsen, Bishop of the Minneapolis Area Synod. Pastor Ostley has been called to serve as a chaplain at Fairview Southdale Hospital. After the ordination, Bishop Svenningsen asks the assembly for their support and prayers, and we are invited to join them by answering each question with, we will, and we ask God to help us. So I present for ordination to the Ministry of Word and Sacrament, Catherine Ann Osley, who's been prepared, examined, and approved for this ministry, and who's been called by the church to this ministry through M Health Fairview at Southdale Hospital in Edina, Minnesota. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. All baptized Christians are called to share in Christ's ministry of love and service in the world to the glory of God and for the sake of the human family and all creation. According to apostolic usage, you are now to be entrusted with the office of word and sacrament in the one holy Catholic Church by the laying on of hands and by prayer. Before Almighty God, to whom you must give account, and in the presence of this assembly, I ask, will you assume this office, believing that the Church's call is God's call to the ministry of word and sacrament? I will, and I ask God to help me. The Church in which you are to be ordained confesses that the Holy Scriptures are the word of God and the norm of its faith and life. We accept, teach, and confess the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian creeds. We also acknowledge the Lutheran confessions as true witnesses and faithful expositions of the Holy Scriptures. Will you therefore preach and teach in accordance with the Holy Scriptures and these creeds and confessions? I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you be diligent in your study of the Holy Scriptures and faithful in your use of the means of grace? Will you pray for God's people, nourish them with the word and sacraments, and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living? I will, and I ask God to help me. And will you give faithful witness in the world that God's love may be known in all that you do? I will and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, we bless you for your infinite love in Christ our Lord, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We thank you that by his death, your son overcame death and that raised by your mighty power, he gives us new life. We praise you that having ascended into heaven, Christ pours out his gifts abundantly on the church making some apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers to equip your people for their work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And now as I lay hands on Catherine, I invite you to extend both one or both hands forward as we join in this prayer. Oh, let us pray. Eternal God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Catherine and fill her with the gifts of grace for the ministry of word and sacrament. Bless her proclamation of your word and administration of your sacraments so that your church might be gathered for praise and strengthened for service. 
Make her a faithful pastor, a patient teacher, a wise counselor. Grant that in all things she may serve without reproach, that your people may be renewed and your name be glorified in the church. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and the people say, Amen. Catherine, receive this stole as a sign of your work and live in obedience to the Lord Jesus, serving his people and remembering his promise. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Will you assembled as the people of God and speaking for the whole church receive Catherine as a messenger of Jesus Christ, sent by God to serve all people with the gospel of hope and salvation? Will you regard her as a servant of Christ? We will, and we ask God to help us. Will you pray for her, help and honor her for her work's sake, and in all things strive to live together in the peace and unity of Christ? We will, and we ask God to help us. Let it now be acclaimed that Catherine Ann Osley is a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ. She has Christ's authority to preach the word of God and administer the sacraments, serving God's people as together we bear God's creative and redeeming love to all the world. Amen. Thanks be to God. Trusting in God's power to heal, let us offer our prayers for all who are in need. We pray for the church's many ministries of healing, for hospital, hospice, and military chaplains, for those serving in prisons, camps, and institutions, for Jill, our parish nurse, and for bishops and pastors facing illness of which we are unaware. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the health of the earth, for its myriad animals and their habitats during these cold days, and for all created life that has been harmed by human misuse. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the health of people around the globe especially for the people of Ethiopia and India, for international health organizations, for local and national medical services, and for school officials and teachers facing the pandemic. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for wholeness in our nation, for the safety of our nation's elected leaders, for an end to domestic violence, for an end to prejudice, and for an end to civic terrorism. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for a halt to the pandemic, 
for all who have contracted COVID-19, for healthcare workers, for the prompt distribution of vaccines, and for all who today will die from the virus. All who are sick and suffering, those on our prayer list, those we name aloud silently or in the chat. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation. Give us strength, courage, and hope to continue serving and being a loving community while we're apart. Give comfort to those who yearn for human connection and protection for staff who serve those who are sick. Guide our leaders as they prepare for the annual meeting and continue our capital campaign. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the faithful departed and for their lives of service to others. And we pray that despite sickness and death, at our end, we join with them to find wholeness in you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We respond to God's word by offering ourselves, our time, and our talents to the work of Jesus in the world. We thank you for your generosity in supporting our ministry here at Gloria Day. If you would like to give an offering today, you can see the link on your screen. We also continue our campaign to Rise O Church, a program of renewing our sanctuary and building a new organ. We invite everyone to consider a pledge to this campaign. Please hear these words of support. Gloria Day, this is Stephanie McCleary and Glenn Flatabo. And we are so happy to be here with you all during this temple talk this week about the renewing of the sanctuary um, in sharing some of our excitement about the project um, and why we've been on board since the beginning. And I'll just say to everybody, I personally look at this as historic. I believe, you know, I walk into the building and I look at generations and decades of families and leadership that have invested in the community, invested in the building. And I do feel a sense of responsibility, not just for our two girls. We have two girls that are six and eight. But I believe, you know, this is our time that we need to position the congregation and the church for growth in the coming years. So I, I do look at it historically, I guess, for us as a family of the importance of it. And I know Stephanie has some pretty strong opinions on how it'll make the, the space more accessible as well. Yeah, so I don't, many of you may know that I'm a teacher um, by trade and I teach at St. Paul Central High School. Um, and part of training as a teacher is how can you make your curriculum, your space accessible for everyone. So universal design is really something that I've tried to embrace as I rearrange my room or as I teach my lessons. Um, and I think that the new um, design of the floor plan is what's really gets me excited because the rearrangement of something as simple as the pews will be more accommodating to many shapes and sizes of people. Um, people with walkers, people with chairs, uh, disability chairs. I mean, it, it just, it gets more welcoming the more that you can rearrange the space for all different kinds of people. The other thing that gets me excited about the floor plan is the front of the church that could be used for any number of things from ceremonies and services that are glory day specific, but also open it up to people in the community. We could have concerts, we could have speakers, we could have lectures, um, and just any way that we can bring in the community into the church, I think will lengthen the lifetime of the church. Um, it's common that we know that younger generations are not 
coming to church as often. So I think any way, shape and form that we can bring in people, um, it's got to be a good thing for us. So lastly, um, we're excited about this personally, and this is kind of fun for me personally, because actually I raise money for a living, and I just decided that if you pledge in the next 15 minutes, the pastors will match all gifts up to a million dollars. So I just added that. (laughs) In all seriousness, no, I think this is our time. It is critical that we do this now, especially come out of COVID. I think it's, it's more important than ever. And we just appreciate the congregation rallying behind this effort. And we will look back and be glad as a community that we did this. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Before we go, just a few announcements. On Sunday, February 14th, because we love each other on Valentine's Day, we will gather after worship on Zoom for our annual meeting to report on last year adopt a budget, and a proposed land acknowledgement statement from our Racial Justice Committee. You're invited to join us today after worship at the link on your screen for a deeper exploration of our financial reports and the proposed budget for 2021. 
Given the pandemic, our budgeting has changed to reflect new realities. So we invite you to come and join us as we discuss our mission. As always, thank you for your generosity of resources and of spirit. On Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., our Immigrant Support Committee will present a proposal to create a, an apartment in our building to house an immigrant family. Bring your questions and your comments. We're eager to hear from you. On Wednesday, February 17th, we gather for worship on Ash Wednesday and begin our Lenten journey together. We will be passing out some kits so that you can participate on this important, solemn day. Plan to drive over to church after the annual meeting next week to pick up your kit. We have a special surprise in each packet, and we promise that the line will go faster than it did on Rally Day. God the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.